I do not need a script. I can I can run the meeting without. Um what I had sent it to you earlier this morning, but um oh, you, said, you said you said if yeah. you if you said something I'll I'll use it. You're fine. We're ready when you are, Mr. Chair. Great. Uh, let's go. Give me one moment. I'm just pulling up a different agenda here. Well, not a different agenda, but probably an amended agenda. All right, here we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is 11.31 a.m. Uh, we hereby call to order the regularly scheduled meeting for RCHCA. At this time, uh, I'd like to go ahead and ask that all uh, please rise and join me in pledging allegiance to the greatest flag on God's green earth. Right hand over your heart, ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you very much. You all may take your seats. Uh, Lucy, would you please conduct the roll call? We want to claim jurisdiction. Please state your name. City of Corona. Tom Richards. City of Hemet. Jackie Peterson. Lake Elsinore. Steve Manos. Benefee. Moreno Valley. Marietta. Lisa DeForest. Harris. Michael Vargas. City of Riverside. Steve Hemet. Temecula. Dave Stewart. Waldemar. Joseph Morabito. County of Riverside District 5. That concludes roll call and we have quorum. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, we are going to move on to public comments at this time. Any member of the public can address the board regarding any items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board that are not separately listed on the, this agenda. Members of the public will have an opportunity to speak on agendized items at the time that the item is called for during discussion. At no time may no action be taken on items that are not listed on the agenda unless authorized by law and whenever possible. Lengthy testimony should be presented to the board in writing and only pertinent points which should be presented orally. Uh, with that, do we have any requests from the public to speak on the this open item? I'm sorry, I didn't hear anything. Lucy, is there anybody, any member of the public that wishes to speak under this section of the agenda? There are no requests in the room or online. Very good, thank you. All right, uh, that moves us to the consent and policy calendar item. All items presented uh, under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and may be enacted by in one motion prior to the motion to consider any action by the board, any public comments on any of the consent items can and will be heard. Any members of the public wish to comment on the consent calendar at this time? Hearing none, uh, we're going to move forward. If a member of the board requests, uh, we can pull any item or discussion from the consent calendar. Uh, do any of the board members wish to pull any item from the consent calendar? Do any members of the board have any questions on any of the items? No, but Paris moves to approve. William, our second. Thank you very much. We we got a Paris with the motion. Who had the second? Wildemar. Wildemar, thank you very much. Is there any discussion to the motion? 
Hearing none, Lucy, can you do me a favor and call the roll call vote this time? Mayor Corona? Aye. Emmett? Aye. Lake Elsinore? Aye. Benefi? Ms. Sobeck? Marina Valley? Marietta? Ms. DeForest? City of Paris? Yes. Riverside? Yes. Temecula? Yes. Wildemark? Yes. County District 5? Um, and going back to Marietta, Ms. DeForest, are you still online? There's no response. Uh, we, that concludes the roll call voting and the item passes or not. Thank you very much. I, I, I believe Ms. DeForest might be uh, off site. Might, might be why she's not responding, but thank you very much, Lucy. All right, we're going to move forward uh, to reports and discussions. Members of the public will have an opportunity to speak on agendized items at the time the item is called for discussion. <clears throat> item 6A is the is a presentation by Parks HCA's Rihanna Fisher regarding the agency budget. Uh, Rihanna, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Uh, so I'm presenting on item 6A, a staff report regarding the proposed budget for fiscal year 24-25. Uh, our general funds revenue sources for the upcoming fiscal year primarily include SKR mitigation fees, transfers from member agencies, interest income, grants, and other contractual revenues. Uh, mitigation fee revenue is expected to remain lower than a normal. Uh, we anticipate a decline in interest revenue to an average of about 14% for the next fiscal year. Uh, since the past fiscal year, uh, there may be some inconsistencies in the way the member agencies are collecting or even uh, <clears throat> So we are going to look into that and we may need to do an audit uh, in the upcoming fiscal year as well. Uh, despite these challenges, uh, we are positive. Uh, we have some positive developments such as the receipt of $157,000 for year two of the Bureau of Land Management Fuels Grant um, and also $104,000 for the remainder of the Bureau of Land Management and indeed your species grant as well. Down. So moving on to expenditures, uh, the from the general fund, they encompass various critical areas such as administrative salaries and benefits, general operations, land management for RCHCA owned lands, and educational outreach opportunities uh, not covered by endowment funds. For fiscal year 24-25, we're proposing a 24% increase in expenditures from the previous fiscal year. Uh, this increase is primarily driven by inflationary pressures and rising operational costs across several areas, including salaries and benefits, overhead costs, and consulting labor. Uh, additionally, we have accounted for some one-time expenses related to legislative outreach trips uh, to audit consultant fees for a nexus study and uh, field equipment purchases, which will be reimbursed by the Bureau of Land Management Fuel Grant. Projected revenue for the general fund is approximately $930,000 with a fund balance drawdown of $569,000. Uh, against these figures, uh, we anticipate expenditures of approximately $1.4 million. These uh, projections are uh, part of our efforts to maintain financial stability and achieve our strategic goals. Uh, so shifting our focus to the Lake Matthews Reserve operations, uh, these are funded through endowment and contractual agreements. Uh, they support critical activities such as staff salaries and benefits, land management, biological surveys, uh, research programs, and community outreach. Uh, the Lake Matthews budget is projected to have a revenue of $257,000 um, and a fund balance drawdown of $305,000 against expenditures of $562,000. Uh, so in summary, our agency budget, total agency budget revenues and fund balance drawdowns are approximately $2.22 million against uh, two million in expenditures, representing an overall 24% increase in expenditures and a minimal decrease in total revenues and fund balance drawdown uh, from the previous fiscal year. Uh, so we're permitted uh, committed to providing regular updates to the board throughout the fiscal year, uh, closely monitoring revenues and expenditures to ensure our financial goals are met. Um, and I believe that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions or discussions regarding the proposed budget for fiscal year 24-25. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Uh, do any members of the public have any questions or comments this time? 
Seeing and hearing none, do any members of the board have any questions or comments? Now the uh, what the request of action by staff is to adopt resolution number 2024-1, a resolution of the board of directors of Riverside County Habitat Conservation Agency adopting the fiscal year 2024-2025 agency uh, budget. Can I get a motion and a second to approve this item from the board? Temecula moves. Do we have a second? Paris. City of Temecula makes the motion. City of Paris makes the second. Any discussion to the motion? Lucy, would you please conduct the poll? Roll poll vote. City of Corona? Aye. City of Hammond? Yes. Lake Elsinore? Yes. Enifee? Moreno Valley? Marietta? Paris? Yes. Riverside? Yes. Temecula? Yes. Wilmore? Yes. County District 5? Yes. Thank you. That concludes roll call voting, and the item passes unanimously. Thank you very much. That concludes all of the action items on our agenda. The rest are receiving file. That takes us to item 6B, uh, which is an update by RCHCA's uh, Brian Shomo regarding recover, uh, recovery efforts for the Stevens Kangaroo Rat. Brian, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Monos. I uh, appreciate that, and good morning to the board. Item 6B, as you stated, is a brief update on uh, Stevens Kangaroo Rat recovery efforts uh, since our last meeting was too far. Uh, the major update is regarding the habitat suitability model. We last updated this model in 2019 uh, during the previous five year status review by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. We've learned a lot in the preceding five years of monitoring the animal of suitor range wide monitoring effort. Uh, so the update basically uh, includes, it's going to get a lot of technical type terms, I'll try to simplify it, but if you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to, you know, get into it with you uh, more detail. But basically, we test a bunch of variables. Uh, what's important to the kangaroo rat? Is it elevation? Is it topography? Is it slope aspect? That kind of thing. Uh, we took all those variables and threw them into what we call a multivariate, a multivariable model uh, to create a really a conservative approach. Uh, we don't want to be really ambitious. We want to kind of narrow that focus down. Where are these animals really at? So we can concentrate our monitoring in those specific areas. And so once we had that kind of conservative model, we needed to test it. We needed to tune it. Uh, and so what we went back uh, to do, we looked at 973 historical occurrences of actual trapping data. And so that went from 2004 to 2003. Um, we then basically ground truth the model. Uh, made sure it was accurate and predictive capability. Uh, the other neat thing that we did and we didn't do in 2019, in 2019, we used only one year of aerial imagery. Uh, that was a 2017, uh, basically, aerial imagery. And that year, if you guys recall, was a pretty dry year. So it was maybe a little ambitious on where the STR were located. And so what we did in this update was take 19 years of aerial imagery and then average it out. So we get wet years, we get dry years, and hopefully that will increase the pre predictive capability of the model. We simplified it, uh, we averaged it out, and hopefully that increases the accuracy. And so at the bottom here, you'll see the basically the final model used these nine predictors. And the biggest one, the bare soil index in September, uh, accounted for about 50% of the weight that the kangaroo rats cared about. Uh, so it makes sense to us biologists when we go out there, that's why we monitor in the fall. Uh, we always say the kangaroo rats like 50% grass to soil uh, cover uh, by midsummer. And so if you find bare soil in September, more than likely you're going to find kangaroo rats there. And then you get into a whole bunch of statistical stuff you probably don't want to talk about much, but normalized difference in vegetation index that talks about reflectivity, uh, topographical wetness, how damp slopes are, and this and that. They don't like a lot of damp slopes. Uh, castle cap brightness is the change in reflectivity from uh as the vegetation matures and dries out anyway long story short uh we came up with this and i was going to actually show you how the model worked but unfortunately with all this technology we have uh doing a hyperlink uh is difficult so we get to bore you with a static picture uh but you'll get the gist of it uh, basically all that green there is potential skr habitat uh within that green area though much like our cities that we have there's some better neighborhoods and there's some, you know, more challenging neighborhoods. And so 
what our model tried to do then is pick the best neighborhoods that we could find kangaroo rats in within those green shaded areas. And so when we tested it, it came out like this. And it really does accurately reflect, and it takes into account management uh, for kangaroo rats to place our sample cells for this year's monitoring cycle. So in years past, you might have seen that we sampled 80 uh, different sample cells throughout the region of FKR from northern San Diego to the western other side. And of those, we get usually about a 50% set aside for live traffic. We go out there and like on the other 50%, we don't see kangaroo rat sign, uh, even though the model may have predicted it's suitable in some ways. So this year, we're hoping when we go out there this year, uh, that our new and improved model will say, yeah, within this green blobs and these green suitable sites, uh, these areas are really going to show you kangaroo rats. And so we can show an increase in occupation. We can show an increase in animal abundance, that type of thing, which will all feed into that recovery effort, uh, the, the next status review, which is occurring next, next federal fiscal year, uh, which is something we want to talk about uh, coming up here. Uh, but you'll see those areas, the black dots are your revisits. We have 50% uh, revisits, 20% new sample sites for revisits, kind of show us the year-to-year -year variation of long-term trends. The new ones we talk about are discovery sites. Where can we find new occurrences of these animals? And then within those, we kind of, you know, uh, vet it down even further. And we have primary and alternates and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, we'll let you know. It's a great, so far, uh, with the model testing, it's on the ground truth thing. It looks to be a lot more accurate, probably because the variables now that we've selected, we've learned more about uh, STR natural history. And so the variables we've selected are more indicative of uh, actually where the animals are going to be located. And I believe the five-year averaging is really going to play a part in that, uh, or I mean the 20-year averaging of the Landsat imagery. Uh, so we're not just taking into kind of dry year or wet year, we've averaged that all out. So uh, the next slide. So as I talked about at the last meeting, uh, and I, I, I need to take a step back. So we got a lot of interest, which is really great uh, from a lot of board members that wanted to help out. Uh, and, and, and help us with our legislative outreach effort and that after last meeting. But I, I maybe have left the impression that that's going to be an immediate thing, uh, and it's not. Uh, it's, service is expected to conduct another STR status review in 24-25. That begins in the federal fiscal year, so October. Uh, and at that point, I surprised more tuned into it than we are, but you have a, a major election cycle come out. Our representatives may change, the administration may change in Washington. Uh, so, so, you know, those may be more tuned into that. But we expect things to change. Uh, and so we want to wait till after the election cycle is over uh, to really start scheduling out our meetings and stuff like that, and really let the Fish and Wildlife Service start to get into. Uh, the status review. And so we're anticipating doing a series of legislative and agency uh, department and interior type outreach events uh, in the spring of 2025, uh, once all the kind of dust settles from the election cycle and everything. The previous outreach we did was coordinated uh, through a great part by a lobbyist that WRCOG had employed at the time. Uh, WRCOG no longer has that lobbyist. So again, we had talked about it. Here are these one time expenses that we put into the budget. Uh, we may have to basically acquire our own lobbying services, or we're looking into piggybacking off of somebody else's lobbying service to save a little funding uh, there. But that'll have to be coordinated through uh, a lobbyist to help us get into some of these uh, offices and coordinate those schedules. So it's not a it's a very productive trip. Uh, we can set multiple meetings in one day, that type of thing. And so we're looking into that uh, just to let you know. And the other important thing is, uh, and. I, I don't have a good answer why this has been in a draft status for the last 30 years, but every threatened and endangered species is supposed that within two years of being listed have a recovery plan, an outline of how to recover the species. The federal government is supposed to do this. And it's been 30 years since 1996, uh, you know, and we're still working with the draft recovery plan for Stephen's kangaroo rat. So finally, we've really, you know, pressured U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service during this next status review. Uh, they have agreed, they've assigned a person finally to put this draft recovery status or on the plan into a final uh, plan. And that's important as far as recovery efforts go. It prevents the goalposts from being moved. Uh, it finalizes things and provides a roadmap. And we did speak to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service yesterday because one of my questions was, well, if there's a whole bunch of new 
conditions, say, for recovery since the previous draft status, does that prevent it from being recovered? And they assured us no, that there can be some items that can be outstanding and we can still recover the species uh, in due amount of time. And so that was good news. And so I'm glad to see this. They're actually putting their money uh, on this and hired somebody and their specific job is to coordinate the local office, the RCHCA, and all the other partners in this endeavor and come up with a final recovery plan. It takes it out of the hands of the local office down in Carlsbad and assigns it to the regional office. So it has more importance and it, we were assured it will be final. So all good news. Uh, and that, I believe that's the end of my oops, wrong button. Uh, presentation. I'll be happy to take questions at this time. That either item is for a receiving file. <laughs> Mr. Shomo, uh, reach out to the public. Is there any member of the public that's on uh, that has any questions or comments? Hearing none, uh, this is a time for board members to debate, discuss, uh, uh, and have, ask questions or, or have comments. Is there any member of the board that wishes to uh, explore uh, the item? Uh, maybe ask some questions of Mr. Shomo? Hearing none. Uh, we're going to uh, accept that report as a receiving file. Thank you, Brian. And we're going to move on to item 6C. This is the uh, an update by RCHCA's call-in strats regarding the SKR management and monitoring efforts. Uh, Mr. Strats, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, board members, thank you for being here today. Um, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Colin Strats. Uh, and I assumed the nat the role of natural resource manager uh, in February of 2024. Uh, just a brief background on myself. Uh, I graduated from Cal Poly Pomona with a degree in environmental biology and emphasis in ecosystem uh, ecology and management and a minor in regenerative studies. Uh, I began my career in environmental conservation as a core member with nerd conservation experience, uh, which allowed me to work with a variety of federal agencies, including National Park Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, and then to explore a variety of conservation projects um, and be involved in a wide-ranging um, wide uh, wide number of projects, as well as uh, working with a variety of individuals across the country. Uh, I had the opportunity to work in Utah, South Dakota, and Kentucky during my travels, um, and this really gave me an opportunity to kind of be exposed to different individuals of different backgrounds and uh, kind of expand my uh, general experience with land management uh, and practices that could be employed in our practice. Uh, I later gained employment at the uh, Inland Empire Resource Conservation District as a field ecologist, where I worked for the last six years. Uh, during my time at IRC, I was directly involved in the management of a variety of habitat mitigation projects where I directed and educated staff members on enhancing and restoring landscapes to achieve goals outlined in habitat mitigation monitoring plans. Uh, eventually, I had the opportunity to assume positions at the IRSD as an inland food specialist, uh, as well as an interim natural resource manager and a natural resource admin manager. Uh, these positions allowed me to increase my experience and knowledge uh, and experience with project management, land management, and principles of ecology, and ultimately have solidified my love and interest in conserving lands and being involved in habitat restoration. Uh, coming to the RCHCA, RC I'm extremely grateful to continue this passion of mine as well as to be involved in our local community and be involved with the Stephen Kangaroo Rat um, restoration habitat, or excuse me, uh, preservation or efforts, excuse me. So moving on to our SKR management activities. Uh, in fall of 2023, so last fall, the RCHA was awarded a federal financial assistance from the Bureau of Land Management through the BLM California, California Fuels Management and Community Fire Assistance Program. Uh, this allocation totaling approximately 1.2 million was designated to fund the staff and equipment expenses for fuel management and habitat enhancement projects at RCHCA over the next five years. Uh, recently, the RCHCA acquired new equipment to assist with ongoing land management activities, including following. Uh, so a two uh, Polaris Ranger util utility vehicles, which are up in the upper right-hand corner, to assist with fuel operations and to enhance with the mobility across terrain. Uh, we also acquired two 55 gallon UTV skid sprayers, which were are uh, used to transport or are transported using the UTV vehicles. And the UTV, or excuse me, the skid sprayer attachments allow for increased efficiency and um, actually safety when using our herbicide application. Um, 
We also acquired a 200 gallon herbicide boom sprayer, which is located in the uh, second to the left, um, with a 14 foot wing uh, attachment to allow for increased herbicide applications over large landscapes. Uh, this tool will be especially, especially useful with managing our non-native or annual grasslands that exist throughout um, both MWD and RCHC and BLM lands. Uh, and lastly, uh, we acquired a 12-foot wide um, backwing rotary mower recently. Uh, this is an attachment for our tractor. Um, it's noted in the second from the right. Uh, our backwing rotary mower will be extremely uh, extremely helpful with our mowing operations, again, controlling our annual grasslands, uh, reducing fuel, flashy fuels, and overall contributing to uh, SKR management. Uh, lastly, um, or excuse me, these recent equipment acquisitions represent a substantial investment in our operational capabilities and allow for increased safety and efficiency during field operations and herbicide applications. Uh, and then over the last several months, our team has utilized some of this equipment to strategically apply herbicide within the reserve, Adults conduct controlled mowing operations to reduce the abundance and development of non native species, uh, namely stink net, which I'm sure has been mentioned here before. Um, additionally, due to the sheep grazing uh, operations being unavailable this year, uh, the RCHA has recently coordinated with the local goat herder to graze rotationally, or to rotationally graze goats on RCHA lands to increase annual grass abundance as well as non native abundance. Uh, they're noted in the top left corner, extremely cute. We have a wide variety of uh, goats on the property right now, ranging from males and females, as well as a new litter of goats, which at the moment I'm escaping me on the correct term for for young, for young baby goats. Um, but they're uh, just recently came onto our property, so we're starting to uh, experiment with the rotational grazing of goats, and we'll be keeping our eyes on that and seeing uh, if we can uh, evaluate the performance. Um, I'd also like to highlight our smaller scale habitat or excuse me, smaller scale habitat enhancement projects uh, related to rare plants within the reserve. Uh, using data available from uh, project partners and from the California Natural Resource, or excuse me, California Natural Diversity Database, our, di our team has begun identifying locations where rare, threatened, and endangered plants exist within the preserve. Uh, these species identified in the slide are either state and federally threatened or endangered or likely to become threatened or endangered. Uh, our team is beginning to conduct small scale habitat enhancement projects to reduce non-native species presence and ideally allow for the passive recruitment of these species, ultimately uh, resulting in increased population sizes. Uh, and then these species and these actions support MSHDP goals and also ideally prevent additional plant species from being threatened or, and or endangered. Lastly, or I guess next on the list, uh, recently the RCHA and WRCOG teamed up for a Earth, or excuse me, an Earth Day planting event at the reserve. Uh, RCHC staff members prepped an area for the planting events uh, through moving in your grasses, arming holes, and identifying planting areas, uh, and purchasing and picking up plants. Uh, on the day of the event, our, uh, WRCOG staff was extremely helpful with transporting and transplanting plants within the restoration area. Overall, 57 plants were installed, and the event was accompanied with an interpretive uh, education hike that was led by Brian Shemo. And then lastly, uh, our team is currently preparing for a prescribed fire event in coordination with Cal Fire and Metropolitan Water District. Uh, recently, our team began delineating the border of the prescribed fire uh, within the lands located north of the lake, or the, uh, located on the north side of Lake Matthews. Uh, next week, we have some crews coming out to assist with establishing handline to uh, create the final border for the burn areas. Uh, and uh, prescribed burn activities are anticipated to occur during the week of June 3rd and June 10th. Uh, during the event, uh, CAL FIRE will be conducting their C234 classes uh, to allow CAL FIRE staff members to increase their skills and knowledge in fire management. And then lastly, these project partnering collaborations are mutually beneficial to CAL FIRE and RCHA and allow for a reduction in non-native annual grasses abundance and increase in bare ground habitat which ultimately benefits uh, Stephen's finger rat, among other species covered with the MSHEP. Uh, and I just want to finish that off with thanking you all for the opportunity to be here with you today. I'm very excited for this position that I'm in. I have a lot to learn, but I'm looking forward to it. And I have some great colleagues and great staff members alongside me to help out with that. So thank you. Yes, then you do. <laughs> you all.
Yeah. Feel free to call them. <laughs> yeah. A lot of names. Yeah. And again, happy to answer any questions too. Then. I have a question. Yeah. Are we going to be invited to watch the burn again this year? I, I, we can make that happen. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and it should be pretty good because uh, this year they're trying to burn more than they ever have. The last year was pretty small, I think. It came out. Uh, and uh, it was only 80 acres. But uh, this year they're trying to do at least 300, if not 700. Is it going to be at 6 in the morning again? I'll tell you what, it, they start at 6, but they don't get kick off until like 9 or 10. So, oh, okay. you know, they tell you to be there at 6, but it's like, hurry up and wait. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, you, the, you were in the military, it's the hurry up and wait. It was our 30 and uh, no go until like 9 a.m. So, but yeah, okay. uh, come out and uh, by all means come out. And it's kind of neat. Uh, we had board members use the flame service before. We've had, we, uh, they, they allow us to use some of the equipment and everything. Uh, the uh, guns that shoot these little incendiary devices called sausages that shoot across flame like sparklers. Uh, so it, it could be a good time. Uh, if you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so I was uh, I didn't have a chance to introduce Colin. Uh, but yeah, as he said, he's had a variety of experience, six years of experience with Darcy as an active resource manager, uh, doing great things. And he's already made quite a difference on our uh equipment by recommending those certain uh pieces of equipment. We are trying to take our state net from a more of a residential to a commercial scale of uh, uh you know combating it. And so I think with his knowledge and that equipment, I hope those are pieces that's in there. Yeah. I'm sorry, did you have a question? No. Oh. Oh, yeah, I have two uh, comments on that. One, the first one is you mentioned SkinkNet. Man, that thing almost didn't even exist a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Remember the first little plant in my backyard because you know, when we went away from the lawn and that the weeds are coming, it's like, oh, my that's really cute. And now it's just everywhere. So I, mean, I, don't, I don't know when we're going to just decide to adopt just the California state flag. I believe it's here. It, 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 you're not putting that genie back in the bottle. What we are trying to do, though, is prevent it from... So there's monocultures out there. You drive down the freeways, you see it on the side, you see it in people's yards. We don't want that to happen in the reserves, uh, the FKR reserves. And so if we can keep it at a manageable level at this point, again, I don't think we're going to eradicate it. That course has left the barn a long time ago. Uh, but we can keep it at a manageable level. We just needed the equipment. And so we waited to buy that equipment until we got Colin on board because he has more experience than we do with that type of stuff. Uh, so he made a lot of those recommendations uh, that there's some money built into that budget. There's 85,000, which is one of the reasons the expenses kind of went up. Uh, but it, for additional equipment, that will also be reimbursed by the BLM grant. Uh, so anyway, there's more on the horizon. Uh, stay tuned. Um, we're going all out. <laughs> so then the other one was because you mentioned goats and I'm assuming they're kids, right? Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Last time was sheep, right? Right. So RGD producer uh, retired, uh, you know, and he was one of the last ones in Southern California. And his son, unfortunately, doesn't want to continue it. Uh, you know, one of those things. There's not a whole lot of money in it. Uh, and so he, had, he retired and we weren't able to get the sheep out. But we have contacted the California Wool Groves Association. Uh, they recommended a fellow up in Bakersfield, and we initially had talked with him. It was kind of late in the season already, and so logistically, he wasn't able to come down. He is interested in coming out next year, though, and so we will keep contact with him. But in the meantime, uh, as far as St. Matt's concerned, uh, those sheep don't eat St. Matt. It smells too bad for them, but the goats seem to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have these 400 goats out there kind of as a trial run. So the sheep don't really like to eat. Uh, even if you share them, they get... They don't like to eat. Goats do. We may do this rotational grazing where in the winter we're grazing for grasses and, you know, trying to protect our forbs. And then we may bring in the goats to kind of clean up uh, the stink net and stuff that the sheep wouldn't eat. So it's kind of an experiment. We've never grazed goats before. I've been always hesitant about grazing goats because they will eat everything and anything. Uh, and so we've been hesitant to do that. But there are areas where there's not much there from biological sense except for non-native grasses and, and kangaroo rats. And so if we can get those grasses down and the same net down and promote the kangaroo rats with the goats, we might have a double with, you know, double edged sword sort of thing, uh, wintertime uh, sheep and summertime goats. So, and just as a side note, if you guys want to come out and see a little baby goat, they may be cuter than the lambs. Uh, I never thought that would be possible, but they have little floppy ears and they're quite cute, mate. 
you know, they whine just like a little baby. Uh, you know, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, every, the door is always open to the board members. If you guys want to bring your families out and whatnot, we'll make time, give you a nice tour. Uh, springtime particularly is a beautiful time to be out there. Perfect temperature. So. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Right. 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 We're, we're, we're going to open it up to any uh, comments by members of the public. Are there any members of the public that wish to go ahead and ask any comments or questions? And hearing none, uh, are there any other board members that wish to discuss this item? Hearing none, this is a receive and file item. We're going to go ahead and move on to item uh, six point or six point B. This is the educational outreach uh, program activities update presented by Brianna Fisher. Uh, and uh, Ms. Fisher, you have the board. Thank you, Chair Manos. Uh, so just providing an update on our educational program um, that we held in the fall. Uh, we do a art contest that follows the event. Uh, and as a recap, uh, our CHCA hosts over 335th grade students from Hemet, Lake Elsinore, and Reno Valley Unified School Districts this past fall for our endangered species for celebrating the event. Uh, these students are immersed in outdoor learning experiences. Uh, uh, at the Southwest Multi-Species Reserve and our Lake Matthews Reserves, uh, aligning with the NGSS uh, standards, and they, uh, it fosters a deep understanding of endangered species conservation is what we want to focus on. Uh, so to complement these experiences, we follow up with an art project um, where students are encouraged to illustrate what endangered species conservation means to them based on their day at the event. Um, so this initiative not only sparked creativity, but also reinforced the educational messages uh, that we convey during the visit. Uh, so the art project concluded in March. Um, the entries were judged based on creativity, relevance to the theme, art, and artistic skill. Uh, the winners were selected across categories such as best overall, uh, most creative, and um, first, second, and first place. Uh, so we're excited to present, we were excited to present the awards to the winners um, and recognize all the students that, that participated uh, with participation awards during the scheduled presentations at each school. Uh, so these are from Western Center Academy. <laughs> we have some cute ones. Not exactly uh, animals in our area, but <laughs> did a great job. <laughs> um, also, this is from Rice Canyon Elementary School. So also some great entries as well. Um, it was very difficult to pick this year. Um, so our educational programs, uh, integration of outdoor experiences and, and art has proven to be a successful strategy. Uh, by engaging the students in fostering environmental awareness. Um, we were made committed to providing meaningful educational experiences that inspire the next generation of environmental stewards, hopefully some more biologists. <laughs> um, and I believe that concludes my report. This is a receiving file. Uh, do we have any members of the public that have any questions or comments? There are none. Let's open up discussions by the board members. Any questions? There are none. This is a receiving file. Thank you very much for the report. We're going to move on to report from the general manager, Dr. Kurt Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so first, a reminder that General Assembly is in 42 days. Um, so I believe most of you are already registered. Um, if not, uh, please let us know if your staff is having any difficulties. And as a reminder, uh, while two of you also serve on the executive committee for uh, WR COG, uh, the rest of you are still voting members of the General Assembly for, for WR Cog. Uh, so you will have official duties as you do every year at the event. Uh, our speaker this year will be Sean McVeigh, the head coach from the Los Angeles Rams, and we're uh, looking forward to a good event. Uh, and second, I want to turn it over to Brian to sort of complete the report uh, for two things. One, uh, he may have some other staff he would like to introduce because he's had a busy time since the last meeting. Uh, and second, we have one item um, that I would like Brian to sort of update you on. Uh, this is an item that came sort of after the posting, so it's not listed as a regular agenda item. So instead, I'm asking for just sort of this one-way communication, informational only. So as, as much as it pains me, I am requesting that you would ask no questions or provide no input to the things he says. Uh, however, staff will be available for you um, outside of that. Um, and before I do, uh, one other introduction. Stephanie, I'm not sure if you want to, would you like to do an introduction or? Oh, uh, sure. I'm replacing Aaron Geddes as counsel for RCHCA. Um, and he is my boss. So he is very busy now as the chief of land use. So I'm a deputy that works under him and I've been working with the county since 2021. So thank you for welcoming me. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, so as Kurt said, 
Uh, we talked about it uh, previously, but the NPR HCT permit renewal uh, expires in May of 2026, about two years from now. Um, as part of that, we certainly don't want it to expire uh, to impact development within Western Riverside. And so we kicked off our first meeting with the wildlife agency. They had pretty much listening, they had trying to address questions and that. But as you said, uh, the meeting occurred after the deadline for the staff reports were due. So I do plan on bringing a comprehensive update at the next meeting uh, as far as uh, the permit renewal application goes. Uh, but we met with our uh, US Fish and Wildlife CFW, uh, the state and the feds on April 23rd. Uh, basically, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has a process in place. Uh, kind of defined already. And as long as we get the renewal application in within six months of the permit uh, permit expiration, uh, we're fine. Even if it takes them three or five years to process that, that we can continue on as normal. The state, it turns out, does not have a formal process to renew an HCP of this size. And so the main takeaway from that meeting on the state was that they were going to check with their legal counsel to see if they can do what they call a consistency determination. In other words, they would make a determination that they're consistent with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services process and uh, basically approval. And the other question that came up, uh, several questions came up. And so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has to look into whether it's an internal biological opinion or a full-blown biological opinion, which requires publishing in the Federal Register. Uh, that would allow for a lot more public comment and potentially challenges. Uh, so we're hoping it can be an internal biological opinion. The biological opinion just basically states we're proposing this much take uh, through developments or whatnot, and does our mitigation kind of balance that out? And so they give us their opinion on it. Uh, and since it is a renewal, we anticipate it being a quick and dirty internal biological opinion. Uh, they'd have to confirm that. CDFW also has to basically look into whether they also allow a six-month window uh, prior to permanent expiration, just like U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. If it doesn't, if they don't, then that kind of shortens the timeline up. Uh, the last thing uh, I did speak about was that CDFW wants to look into whether they can piggyback off U.S. Fish and Wildlife's determination to the uh, consistent determination for approval. These answer, the answer to these questions should come next week. We have another meeting scheduled on May 14th at 2 o'clock. Uh, and are we allowed to send out an update to the board as long as nobody responds as a group? Yeah, we'll, we'll work into that. Okay. We, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll sort that stuff. I don't bring you in on here. Okay. But that's the gist of it. Uh, we are actively working on it. I want you guys to be assured that uh, from our perspective, it should be uh, seamless. Uh, there should be no uh, interruption in service. Uh, and that uh, we are also looking into the other avenues, the other options. Uh, which is, again, we talked about at the last meeting, there is potential uh, to merge with the uh, Western Riverside MSHCP at some point in the future. Uh, so we're looking into all those options. Uh, the real important thing, though, is to get it renewed, and then we can always, down the road, uh, talk about the other options to, to move forward. So, unfortunately, I have no mistake. But we will have a full-blown report next in September, I think, or next meeting. So. Uh, I'll bring everything to you at that point. Uh, I do want to introduce, we've had a lot of turnover at the RCHA. A lot of our folks have moved on. Uh, and I will say the bigger things, uh, areas that uh, went to the county as the environmental programs director uh, within the planning department. Uh, and Francisco went to uh, work on Black Ops helicopters uh, for the National Guard. He's a contractor now working with Black Ops helicopter maintenance. Uh, to replace them, uh, we have Nathan Heron and Matt Singer. Uh, Nathan Heron uh, spent uh, five years within the U.S. Forest Service uh, hot truck crew, and in the last six years as a county parks uh, ranger uh, down at the South Southwest Multi-Species Resort. Uh, Matt Singer is a former uh, physical education teacher, and he has spent time uh, recently as the uh, Orange County uh, Parks uh, public ranger. And so if you guys would you want to say anything, uh, Matt. Yeah, no, I'm excited to be here. i um, only been here for two weeks, and I've learned a ton. <laughs> but yeah. Excited to be part of the team. Yeah, same thing. Excited. Everything looks really interesting. So, uh, Matt will be our weekend patrol slash security. Randy recently retired. Uh, and his Cal he was actually working on the CalPERS contract type thing. And so we uh, weren't able to renew that. And so he retired. And Matt will be replacing and running our security on the weekends. And Nathan will be helping us with the tech uh, aspect of the field management. So, 
Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. Well, that, that, thank you for the report and the update. We're going to uh, move on to item eight, items for future agendas. Is there any requests for any items on a future agenda? Your silence indicates there are none. So we're going to move to item number nine. Yes, sir, Chair. Yeah. yeah. We have a comment in the room. Yeah. Is there, a, can we look at uh, folding in of RCHCA with RCA and see how, what those steps would be and if that, how that works. Yes, uh, we have outlined a number of uh, issues that would have to be answered before any type of merger of the plans would take place. Uh, we have the legal counsel looking into that. Uh, some of it is between major and minor amendments. I don't want to full lot details, but we have outlined a certain thing. Uh, what I want to say is there's no, you can renew the permit and then cancel it anytime more or less if you want to. Uh, the important thing is to keep that permit in the continuity for building and the development with from Riverside continuing. And if at some point in the future you want to basically look into merging those two plans, there's no problem with doing that at any point. Uh, so we are looking into that, and there will be a, a full blown report uh, coming up in September okay. on that. Uh, hopefully, you can answer a lot of questions. I think some of them will still be outstanding until you really get into actually doing that. Uh, but I think we can hit the highlights. Kind of who was established first? Clark Sneaks, yeah. We were around in 1996. We're a very four group. Yeah. RCA. Uh, eight years RCA. Older. RCA. RCA is a very tough group to deal with, especially when it comes to land use. And when you compared to our friendliness here, of our, of our, <laughs> of our folks, you know, I, I, I have no problem with asking that question and looking into it, but I, I personally have no. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let, let me let me pull this back in because this is not an item for our agenda, and, and certainly, certainly isn't something that you know we should probably be discussing at length. Can't make a decision on it. We don't want to create a forum. You know, it's just a we're just we're just adding the items to the agenda or not adding items to the agenda. We're not discussing and debating those items. Does that make sense? Yeah, you can move on. All right. All right. So let's uh, let's go ahead and do it. any general announcements. Any board members have any general announcements? Hearing none. Next meeting uh, for the joint RCHCA uh, and uh, RCPP uh, is scheduled for May 25th, 2025. So we'll see you next year. And then the next regularly scheduled RCHCA board meeting is scheduled for Thursday, September 12th, 2024 at 11.30 a.m. in W.R. Cog's office at 3390. University Avenue and Suite 200, Riverside. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your decorum. And it is 1217. We are adjourned. <laughs> 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 Yeah,